uh, welcome everyone uh, to this Sacramento Room facilitated program, um, our monthly Sacramento Room Scholars Talk. And today we have two very good scholars um, and local historians. Um, and they happen to be my colleagues, um, Christopher Curran and Jason Weekly, uh, two information professionals who work at the Rancho Cordova Library. And today they're going to speak about their new book, Lower American River. In essence, History of the Lower American River. It was just published this year. Um, still letting folks in. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, so, like I said, both um, Chris and Jason work at the Rancho Cordova Library. Jason has a BA from Grand Canyon University and a master's in theology from uh, Boston University. Chris has a BA from Sacramento State. They are both in the thick of getting their master's degrees in information science at uh, San Jose State. Um, they're also right now writing another book, um, this time with History Press, um, it will be called something like The Lost Villages and Towns of Sacramento County. Um, and they're writing that book with uh, another colleague of ours, Eric Webb, who um, works over at the Art Endemic Library. Uh, when the book is ready, it's going to come out in the su summer of 2022. So that's something for all of us to look forward to. But today, we dive deep into the uh, historic uh, nuance of one of the most beautiful urban rivers in the nation, and that's the American River. I will remind you all uh, that this program is indeed being recorded, and it will be placed both on the Sacramento History Facebook group page, um, and then also on the Sacramento Public Library's YouTube page. Uh, again, no program in August, we will be doing a Valley to Vietnam posting. Um, and then of course, we'll be back in September with something. Uh, it may be a guest scholar and it may be me um, tripping my way through something, but hopefully something informative too. So with that said, I'm gonna turn to our guests, Chris and, Chris and Jason. Um, you two, you, you just, you finish one book um, and then you change gears to write another. And now you have to turn right back around to talk about the one you just wrote, um, which is kind of crazy, but we, but we have you. Thank you, we appreciate being here, James. Um, yeah, it is a little, little crazy. You know, it seems like a while ago that we were focusing on the river and it's like you said, switching gears. But I think in the process of doing this new book too, it helps us kind of that, in being in that research mode, right, triggers right. a bunch of those memories of, from the, doing the river book, so. Yeah. Great. Well, um, it's a terrific book. Um, and, you know, we, we look through all sorts of history press books. They're wonderful tools for accessing the past. Um, you know, nothing is probably more powerful as a prime, when it comes to primary sources um, than a photograph, um, which is, of course, the heart and soul of, of the Arcadia books. Um, so let's jump into this. I've got several questions for you. Obviously, um, those attending the program are going to have questions too, but I'm going to jump right in. And I want to go to pre-European contact when we think about the river. And I want you to tell us about the river's first human users and inhabitants. Um, you refer to the Nishinan, the first Native American group uh, along the American, as having to learn to exist according to the rhythm of the river which is such beautiful writing. And it's the norm for this entire book. You guys are great writers. But okay. tell us more about the nation in, in the river, if you could. Well, first off, thank you, James. Appreciate those, uh, those high words of praise. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the nation uh, folk were um, uh, all along the river, um, mostly on the north side of, uh, of the American River. Um, and the floodplain um, was 
mostly inhabited by um, uh, uh, these folk. And, and it's interesting that there are contemporary accounts, um, contemporary Euro European explorer accounts of um, these raised mounds, of, these raised earthen mounds upon which um, uh, the native people built their homes. And um, it's interesting uh, to hear about how um, these folk would um, move uh, would move along according to um, the natural ebb and flow of the river um, and the uh, the freshets, the um, uh, sudden snow melts um, that would come down from the Sierra and ultimately just pour water um, into into the Sacramento. Um, so uh, not only did they not only did they live and and build their structures here, but they also um, uh, caught um, a lot of their uh, a lot of their food. A lot of, there was a lot of fishing, hunting, gathering along the river. Um, very fertile um, uh, wilderness, very fertile um, land, um, and they they seem to move. Um, or they seem to uh, uh, move along and, and consider the, um, the freshets as they came, um, raising their homes, for instance, um, further, uh, further up to kind of avoid um, the, the sheer mass of water that would come uh, in December and January, as it continues to do um, to this day. Uh, so definitely... Um, Definitely an interesting, uh, an interesting time and a different um, uh, view of the river um, and settlement along the river. It's it's sad to um, it it's very upsetting um, to talk uh, about the American River because um, so much of uh, what the um, what the native people um, had established is lost. Um, uh, very much lost back in the 1830s with uh, with the first European contacts um, in the area. Um, there was a malaria epidemic um, that devastated um, the native population. There were other diseases. We've heard um, this is not this is not to uh, uh, to belittle or um, diminish. This is not to diminish this conversation. Um, but we have heard before how so many um, diseases were brought by the Europeans, and and we see that echoed again. Um, we see that echoed again here in uh, the Sacramento Valley. There was also um, uh, John Sutter, um, who, uh, who was a Swiss immigrant, um, uh, became a uh, Mexican citizen and, and developed a, a land grant or uh, bought a land grant here and started developing um, uh, the area uh, according to European um, mindset and um, he was less than kind. Uh, he was he was brutal. Uh, treated the treated the native peoples brutally. Um, he established um, um, treaties. Uh, we would we would consider them sort of treaties um, with some uh, native groups, but um, in terms of the nation, and they unfortunately they uh, sadly uh, got the full brunt of got the full brunt of. Um, of Sutter's uh, uh, Sutter's ire. Okay, okay. So, um, thank you, Chris, for that for that answer. I I wanted to go ahead and acknowledge um, the comment um, when I posted uh, news about the program on the Sacramento History Group page. There was uh, uh, a participant or a, um, a member of that group who had a question about the ethnic cleansing along the river um, in, in relevance you know, to what we just talked about right here that made so many parts of the river safe for only some of California's residents. And what I wanted to do um, is I wanted to make it such that I've got just a really brief information sheet for everybody to take a look at um, when it comes to um, the lack of access, whether that be residential access, whether that be recreation, um, whether that be um, 
just straight up access to the river um, when it comes to uh, non-Anglo Europeans um, living in the area post-European contact. And that can be broken down to um, Native American genocide. It can be broken down to uh, redlining, also uh, uh, restrictive covenants. So I just posted a little information sheet um, with a few books, book recommendations, uh, Brendan Lindsay's Murder State, Stephen Avella's Indomitable City, and then Wayne Maida provides a really nice um, description of what restrictive covenants are uh, when it comes to some of the developments along the river and how folks, um, a lot of folks would just be pushed out from that. So um, do, do go ahead and take a look at that if you can. If you're not getting it through the chat, the, the PDF I just posted, you can contact me directly at jscott at saclibrary.org and I will send it to you directly. Okay. All right. And, you know, one thing, Christopher, uh, I wanted to go back and have you talk about what I consider one of the coolest early period maps um, that you guys chose to use in your book, which is just absolutely cool. And I believe this is dated at 1849, right? Uh, yeah. Um, Thereabouts, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll go ahead and kind of speak to this uh, slide okay. here. Um, yeah, the, uh, this is part of the uh, 1849 map. It was done by uh, William uh, A. Jackson. Um, and this is just a small portion of the map. Um, and what it does is it shows the um, mining uh, districts in California during that time. And one of the reasons we chose it is, uh, in particular for this presentation, is to it kind of gives a geographic framework of what we're talking about and kind of showing the uh, Nisenan territory and how the uh, early uh, European contact and uh, development have really affected their territory. Um, as you can see on the map, you have the American that starts off as like the North Fork, Middle Fork, and South Fork up there in the Sierras, and they kind of flow down through the foothills um, and come, uh, come together. And the lower American River that we, we really focused on is that part on the map where it says like Bill's Bar um, down to the confluence with the Sacramento. Um, and so when we were talking about the lower American River, that's the main area there that we're talking yeah. about. Um, but yeah, so the, this is all part of the Southwest territory of the Nissan uh, peoples. And, you know, some uh, different, uh, uh, it, this area eventually became under control of the Mexican government and they started issuing uh, land grants uh, to people and you know Sutter being one of the first uh, he established the Sutter's Fort there on the south bank of the American by the confluence which you know we know Sacramento here the city developed um, the uh, other large land grants or to the east you have uh, William Leidesdorf's uh, uh, Rancho Rio de los Americanos and then on the north side, it's not labeled, but you had the um, uh, Rancho uh, uh, Del Paso and the Rancho uh, San Juan. They kind of covered all of that territory there. So in the 1840s, there were already these Anglo settlers moving into the territory. And like I said, this was already post 1830s. The, um, the Nisenan people had already you know, faced a lot of uh, diseases and, um, but there had been a slow trickle of uh, Anglo settlers into the area. But then, and of course, as everyone knows, in 1848, we had uh, James Marshall's discovery of gold up in Coloma. And that just kind of made this, uh, turn this little small trickle of immigrants to this large wave just came to the area. Um, and what this map is really cool about this map is you begin to see how quickly, just from that one year difference, all these settlements and the towns and mining camps that developed. And uh, most of them were up on the upper forks of the, of the American. Um, and you see this like long stretch of like, there's New York Bar, Manhattan Bar, and all the way down to Bills Bar. Um, those are the really prime you know, mining camps that were set up. And most of these were small affairs. Um, but a lot of that now is actually underwater with, the, um, with Folsom Lake with the, when the dam was created. But uh, anyway, so a lot of the California, history kind of can be 
begins, I mean, in the history books and different things kind of begins with the gold rush, but we just you know, want to definitely recognize that, you know, there was a lot of history for thousands of years prior to that. And so, yes, it was a gold rush was a boom to the California, but for the Nissan, it was, you know, the, kind of basically the end of their, their uh, living along the, the lower American river here. Right. Which is going to take us back about uh, 15,000 years. Yeah. Um, is, is the general agreement. Also, as we look at this map, uh, Jason and Chris, I, I think there are a couple of towns on here that don't exist anymore. Do you think that might be fodder for your, your, next, <laughs> your next opus? Uh, Suttersville, which is kind of cute, Margareta yeah. over here on the side. And then this mysterious town just on the north side yeah, of the American River, Childs period, F yeah. period, Childs Ford, um, and then of course, Boston. So um, it's kind of a teaser for what's coming up. This yeah, we wanna give away too many secrets just yet. Yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. All right, so let's move ahead. One of the, one of the great things about a geographic feature, of course, one that's been used so much by a number of different culture groups, um, in a number, number of different ways is that you end up with the best word I can think of would be obscurities. Um, and I was wondering what kinds of things did you all learn about uh, along the way that you included in the book um, and that might have actually surprised you, fascinated you? Um, what do you got? Well, for for me, the one of my favorite topics of uh, researching was um, the the settlement or the town of Hoboken, um, which I think I'm definitely going to be going more into uh, in future projects. Um, but Hoboken was a uh, a gold rush settlement um, that that grew out of, or that was the direct result of um, uh, the flood of 51 and 50, uh, 1851 and 52, um, when Sacramento was uh, inundated um, uh, once again with, with water um, and drowning the, uh, uh, what, what used to be referred to as the business district of Sacramento, we now refer to it as Old Sac. Um, so if, I, pr I always prefer using contemporaneous names for things, so with that said, we're going to be talking about Old Sac. I'm going to be talking about uh, the business district of um, Sacramento. So when uh, the business district was um, completely flooded, uh, by this point, um, the gold rush was well underway. We had um, a number of um, gold camps set up um, up in the Sierra. And uh, despite the fact that all of these companies um, were basically headquartered in uh, the business district of Sacramento um, following the flood, they needed to maintain, um, they needed, needed to maintain contact with their, um, uh, with their holdings up in the Sierra. And um, here we have uh, Hoboken where a bunch of these different companies, a bunch of these different um, um, uh, business people, businessmen, let's be honest, businessmen, um, and um, uh, soon-to-be politicians um, set up camp. And it originally started as a kind of a tent city, but over, over the months, as you can see in this, um, in this lithograph, it, it became an honest-to-gosh uh, settlement with um, wooden structures and uh, even a semi-facetious um, mayoral race um, that uh, ultimately um, this community ultimately kind of folded after uh, a couple of years. So by 1853, you get these accounts of people um, already leaving uh, Hoboken. There's even a um, there's even an account, and I really want to look a little bit more into this because I'm really curious. Um, but there's an account of a uh, of a man who would go on to be a um, justice of the peace for Yellow County, taking um, taking his uh, his possessions and and uh, basically his home, his entire home, building a raft and then uh, taking um, uh, taking his possessions on this raft and navigating down the American River 
from Hoboken and going all the way down to Sutterville um, on the on the Sacramento. I'm not entirely sure. Did I did I mention where Hoboken actually uh, actually was? I don't think I did. Um, Hoboken uh, was uh, uh, basically modern day Sac State. So, um, and if if you can kind of if you can kind of imagine, um, we think it might be uh, somewhere near the uh, the water filtration plant on Sacramento's campus or just off Sacramento's campus. We think that's where that's where it is. So uh, a sizable, uh, lengthy distance um, up the river from from the uh, the flooded uh, business district. But at least you're going down river, right? Yeah, yeah. So the guy, so this particular guy, um, uh, just kind of floated down uh, the rivers, um, the American to the Sacramento, and ultimately uh, ended up in his destination of Sutterville um, near the. Uh, uh, near the modern Sac Sioux. Um, and, oh, sure. Okay. Right. And of course, the idea is that, you know, typically the American River, it's pretty shallow. But when you've got crazy old, you know, winter to spring flooding, that, ele you know, the water elevation goes up, you know, it's, it's obviously something that you can, you can bring boats down um, until the water level goes back to normal, um, which eventually happened. Yeah, there definitely was some uh, controversy to what by with some about how navigable or non-navigable what the river was, um, because yeah, you see during these high water times, you know they could take these steamboats up the river, and during you know Hoboken there was be like four steamboats a day that were delivering cargo and supplies there, um, but yeah, the water goes down, and then those boats couldn't get up there anymore. And so throughout the development of Sacramento area, I mean, anytime there was like a bridge that was put up, it was like controversy, like what type of bridge, what, how high, because it's like, you know, some people felt like, oh, we need to make it to where boats could actually get up um, as, for, as far as up to Folsom if possible. Um, and there were some um, excursions and some attempts to do that over, mm -hmm. over the years, um, which was very interesting to learn about. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for the most part, it's, Unless it's like heavy rains, you're not really going up river, you know, uh, unless you have uh, a very, very small draft on your boat. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So farewell, Hoboken. We, we hardly knew ye, yes. as they say. Okay. So more obscurities, everybody. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and hop back over to the PowerPoint where we've got, uh, oops, sorry, where we've got this rollicking good time on the river. Yeah, um, for me, like there was a lot that you know I in, in researching this book, and uh, there was a lot of things that we learned and um, different obscurities that we'd love to be able to. Some things we were able to include in the book, others just the format kind of prevented itself from that. Um, but we, you know, we talked about like earlier about the you know the Nissan, and then we'll in a little bit here we'll talk about some of the environmental. Uh, impacts of industry and stuff on the river but for me I, I chose this one to kind of bring out just because it was like it just it's just a fun image and a fun thing to kind of think about happening um, along the river here and um, so this is uh, I don't remember what year I forget what year this image particular image was from but what it's showing is the uh, black bart raft race that used Ooh. to take place um, annually um, the uh, from in late September or early, early October um, every year and took place from like 19, late 1960s to the early 1990s. Um, and it was an event that was sponsored by uh, Young Life, which was a Christian uh, youth organization. And, but basically it would attract hundreds to thousands of teenagers would come. They'd build these rafts made of inner tubes and some of them would be elaborate affairs. I mean, they'd, they'd uh, strap, you know, quite a few inner tubes together. Sometimes they put wood planking down uh, to build like some, sometimes like some like uh, paddle wheel type devices and everything. Um, but they would put in um, near uh, what's down Discovery Park. And in this image, you see the Jaboom Street Bridge there and the, um, in the background is the I-5 bridge going over the river. Uh, they'd put in there and then they would float down to the confluence and then uh, float down to Miller Park on the Sacramento River. Um, like I said, it was an annual event. Uh, it just 
it seemed like it was a it was a race, um, but it seemed like for many of the kids, it was more just uh, just to have have fun. Um, and what's also interesting is uh, come this October, uh, there's going to be a California Ironman for the first California Ironman, and the swimming portion is basically going to be very similar to what this course was for back um, back then for the race. And um, anyways, it just a I found it just a uh, entertaining image. Uh, you can actually go on YouTube and there's a couple videos of like uh, videos from like I think the 1970s of a couple of like 72 or 73 uh, oh, really? of the race. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it you know just a fun little kind of thing to check out. So okay. yeah. All right. So so uh, obscurities, uh, a taste of those. Of course, there are so many more. Um, and it's it's what a river brings, um, you know these these wacky recreational events. Uh, I'm from Portland, where we have the dragon boat races, which are really really big in the spring and in the summer. Um, it's it's about living on the on the water for sure. So um, our next question uh, that I've got with post European contact. Um, in effect, after 1829, in, even before that, um, talk about primarily the Anglo-European use of the American River, particularly the river's role in the development very early on of the suburbanization of Sacramento. And it's, it's a term, the term you guys um, reference in the book is agroburbs, agroburbs. So if you could talk a bit about that. I loved researching the agroverbs. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Um, there is a book um, by uh, Paul J.P. Sandul, S-A-N-D-U-L, um, based on his, um, uh, first on his master's thesis, his work for his master's thesis, then his PhD, um, called, uh, this, this book, I mean, is called California Dreaming, Boosterism, Memory, and Rural Suburbs in the Golden State. Um, and from his work, um, we were able to, uh, we were able to benefit. Um, we have four copies in the system, everybody. I highly suggest uh, you put your names uh, and, and borrow this. It's an excellent um, uh, discussion of, of the agroverb. Now, Dr. Sandel uh, talked about the agroverb as being um, uh, a settlement um, where uh, people would buy land um, in various degrees of, um, of uh, cultivation um, from different, um, different property developers. Um, some, of these, some of these were uh, down south. We have places like Orange County, right? Um, things like that. But also in Sacramento, um, the same phenomenon was, um, uh, you know, hit with a vengeance. And so that's why we have communities such as Orange Vale, Citrus Heights, or um, Fair Oaks. Um, in the case of Fair Oaks and, and Orange Vale, these are, uh, these are two settlements. Um, Orangefield predates Fair Oaks, I think, by like a year or two. Um, but the idea behind the agroverb, they are, they are similar to um, uh, the suburbs of the 1950s and, and, and 60s. They're similar, but, they're, but they are distinct phenomenon uh, where um, in the, the post-war years, um, the suburb was, uh, was seen as a place to take people out of the urban core and, and just have them live in the suburbs and then migrate or migrate commute back and forth between, um, uh, between work and home. Um, in the case of the agroverb, on the other hand, people lived here and they worked here. They were here to um, cultivate in uh, the case of, um, uh, in the case of Orangevale and, and Fair Oaks, they were there to cultivate uh, largely citrus. Um, as we can see in this picture, it was, um, it was uh, the raison d'etre for, for, um, for these areas. Another interesting thing about them, especially in the case of Orangevale and, and Fair Oaks, both of these were, were founded as temperance colonies. Um, 
And uh, we see um, uh, several like full booklet um, advertisements um, uh, for these from the property developers going out to um, going out to various customers or settlers, um, um, extolling the virtues of the you know of the American River and and its um, uh, you know the fertile soil along the along its banks, um, and in uh, in the 1890s, when when these were when these were being advertised, it's funny to see these um, uh, to see these advertisements, to see these booklets, and um, see how uh, the tone that they would strike would be very um, lacy and and very floral, um, talking about how you know we 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 seek to um, to uh, make available. Um, these uh, these orchards to the highest society, um, and uh, uh, provide upward mobility for for the best people. Um, and then they, at one point in this one advertisement, they take a very abrupt ninety degree turn and and then start talking about the uh, quote unquote hellhole saloons um, that uh, that they were trying to avoid and and making sure that that nary a, um, a drop of liquor would be found in these. It's also interesting to see that some of these developers um, um, are big names in Sacramento history and in Californian history. In the case of Paris Weinstock, he was um, he was a, a property developer, I think for um, I think it was for Fair Oaks, and he was uh, one of the biggest retailers in Sacramento. Um, he had a he had a large um, building in in what is now downtown Sacramento. And then um, another developer, Valentin McClatchy, which for um, Sacramento was a very massive name. Um, he founded, uh, he was the editor for um, the Sacramento Bee. Um, and um, they definitely were very involved um, in, in these developments. Um, but yeah, so the, the bridge we see here, this is the Fair Oaks Bridge and we can, um, this was built in order to uh, uh, connect these agroverbs, both Fair Oaks and Orangevale, to um, uh, to the railroad. So that way, they would um, uh, the the orchard growers would be able to um, finally sell um, more easily sell their uh, their fruit downtown um, and get that out to market, get that out to a larger market. Yeah, this image yeah, shows the bridge that was built in 1901, and um, and then the previous image, you know, you see that lemon sitting on the rail car, and it just shows how intertwined the uh, railroad and development in the region uh, was. The um, yeah, the uh, producers there in Fair Oaks uh, were really like wanted that bridge built so that they could get to the the tracks, which are on the south side of the river, and um, so then they can get their their product to the market quick, uh, uh, the, the quickest. And um, yeah, so that, that bridge was built in uh, 1901 and then it was washed away in 1906. And the one that now stands was built, I think it was 1907 is the, the structure that currently is out there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so really quickly, there's a, there's a question here um, from, from one of our attendees. Were there racial restrictions in Fair Oaks and Orangevale? Are we aware of that? Um, in the in the case of Orangevale, there were. Um, there there were uh, again there there was a lot of language coded, um, rather surprisingly coded language. But if you read between the lines, it's not um, that hard uh, to imagine. Um, what they were trying to say, but uh, the the phrase "highest society" was repeated over and over again um, in the, especially in these advertisements. Okay. Okay. So um, let's pivot over to what Jason mentioned earlier um, that we are going to talk about the environmental impacts um, on on the river. Um, so. So many industrial endeavors early on, all the way up to this, this current day, um, particularly with, with mining and, and dredging, 
sand and gravel. Um, I got even um, Aerojet, right? Um, and, it, and it's many, many impacts that um, still linger down to this very day, even though Aerojet's got, got one foot out the door toward the American South. Um, so I was wondering if, if you could, you two could, could talk a bit about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, it's the, we like to try to think of, you know, the river as this pristine, you know, uh, never been touched, you know, place, but you no, know, since, you know, the Anglo settlers have come in, you no, know, they've tried to, they viewed the river as, you know, as a commodity. How can we, you know, what, how can we make a profit? From it, um, and that was started with mining. Just um, the the beginning mining operations were were smaller affairs, you know, sm small groups of people getting together. Um, but then it quickly developed into larger scale operations. And one of the big things that caused a lot of destruction was the hydraulic mining. And uh, so hydraulic mi mining, if you don't know, is a process where you divert water uh, from a stream or creek or river and you funnel it through some pressurized cannon and you basically aim this water cannon at the side of a hill and it just uh, breaks the hill down and then all the debris falls through a series of sifts and basically getting the, the gold uh, uh, material out. And then, but the problem is that the debris then washes back into the creeks and streams and flows downstream. Um, and so, in, yeah, this image you have, you can see that one of the cannons just, as it just like, you know, uh, tears into the, um, the, uh, the mountainside there. And like I said, all that debris just washes downstream. And so in the 1880s, um, what was happening was that all this stuff was going all the way down, you know, the American and the, the riverbed was actually rising and it was causing even more flooding. And so you have some farmers that got together and uh, brought a case against um, the mining company. And this is uh, the big well-known case is the uh, Woodruff versus North Bloomfield Gravel Mining Company. Um, and so the case went before uh, Judge Lorenzo Sawyer and he took like two years looking at all the merits of everything. And ultimately in 1884, he decided that uh, hydraulic mining violated the private property rights of the farmers downstream. Um, he didn't base his decision on any like environmental reasons of like, oh, you know, kind of like this, you know, to keep or preserve the environment. It was more like, oh, this violated the, the rights of the farmers. Um, so his decision basically eliminated hydraulic mining because it forced the miners, the hydraulic mining companies to, they could continue hydraulic mining, but as long as they prevented that debris from washing downstream. And it just, that just was not a very feasible option for them. So. Um, it basically, like I said, ended hydraulic mining in California. What's also interesting about that case is it kind of starts showing the shift in the California economy from this mining, you know, the uh, powerhouses to the rise of the uh, farming lobby and how the farming was becoming more and more uh, powerful uh, lobbying group. And um, so, yeah, so you have the hydraulic mining was a big uh, environmental impact and then the um, but then mining didn't stop on the river. No, then it just transformed later on into uh, gold dredging. And um, gold dredging was a process where uh, a dredge was basically looked like a big uh, houseboat, um, but it was like massive. And it would sit in these ponds that would be formed off the river and I would lower uh, a boom into the dirt. And then the boom had all these uh, buckets attached to it. And it would just dig these long um, rows into the uh, the banks of the river, and again the 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 stuff would dig up, it would go through the dredge, sift out for the gold, and then it would spit out the tailings out the back end, and they would just slowly creep along the river bank. And so in this image, which I think this is um, Sacramento Bar along the American River, uh, you see just these these are leftover rows of where the dredges just kind of went through and just tore up. And that's why when you go to the parkway today, you know, it's all, you know, oftentimes you walk over these up and down all these rocky slopes. It's like, these are leftover from the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the gold mining dredgers. And um, let's see. 
And then you get to uh, the third one, like I said, mentioned was the sand and gravel businesses. And those, oh, yeah, and those, again, um, they kind of dovetailed on the gold dredging where, you know, they would do the income, take all these dredging uh, rocks and material, and then um, they would build like rock crushing plants. And then uh, a lot of those, uh, the, the, the gravel and rocks would be used in local construction projects, but they also would just create these, um, well, in, an, in the 1950s, uh, the Sacramento Bee uh, article referred to them as uh, open water filled, filled pustules and scabs like scar tissue. Um, nice. And, and this 1954 foot image, um, you know, you just kind of see that. And, um, but what you do start to see is a change in attitudes uh, in the way towards the river and um, the idea of kind of creating a parkway and preserving the river. And so it took a time, but this particular piece of land here, um, like I said, this is 1954. Uh, the county was a, a, uh, able to acquire it in 1974. Yeah. And this is now what's William Pond Park. Uh, yeah. And so it's one of my favorite places to go birding and there it's, uh, but it's like, you look at this and, and it's like, it was just nothing to what it is like today. Um, but yeah, those, um, those three really cause a lot of long lasting environmental damage to the river that you still see the effects of today. Yeah. So one, one little factoid, uh, the, one of the vice presidents of Aerojet in the early 1950s, when they were deciding where in the heck um, to go when Azusa, their plant there was getting too big, this vice president had actually grown up in Fair Oaks. And so he understood kind of, you know, what had happened with dredging in that area. So that south of 50, east of Mather area, and he thought, wow, all that great dredging and the tr all the tailings from the dredging would be perfect for testing rockets, and testing rocket engines. Therefore, the land was dirt cheap and it was ideal for what they wanted to do. So they ended up coming up here um, in 53, I believe. So, um, all right, so let, let's just, pivot. Just, just quickly add, oh, I'm sure, sorry, yeah, quickly yeah. add to that. But then they also later on think that that because of the dredge tailings, that the um, it led to the all the uh, uh, chemicals and stuff getting into the groundwater, and it contributed right. to the to the, um, the um, all the byproducts, you know, like I said, getting into the groundwater and stuff. So, the, yeah, it all kind of all dovetails together, and it's you know very yeah. interesting to see how that right. Know. And the Air Force isn't getting out of this either because. You know, the impact from Mather Air Force Base, you, well, it's been a while since I've been out there, but you can go out to the weapon, weapon storage area, walk right through the front gate and just see these big drums, you know, laying around and, and they, they're still in the process of cleaning out that area. So, all right, so environmental impact. So next question I've got, um, it's kind of the the elephant in the room when we think of the American River, um, and it makes us a little nervous um, as people who live on a river, as the, the people of New Orleans can relate to, and folks in that Mississippi River Delta area. Um, talk about, um, Christopher, if you could, the, the struggle of flood control um, along the American River and the lengths to which humans have tried to harness the power of a river that, let's all be honest, just wants to be left alone to be a river. Yeah, the, just like you said, the river just wants to be left alone, wants to find, you know, the easiest, uh, the, you know, the path of least resistance to get down to, uh, to get down to the ocean. But, um, you know, we, uh, you know, Sacramento had, had different ideas. Um, so in, in, the case of um, uh, the river, the river was um, rechanneled um, back in the 1860s as a result of a string of floods um, in the 1850s and 1860s. Um, for instance, in uh, 1850, in December of 1850 and January of 1851, um, Sacramento uh, 
experienced a, a devastating um, flood. And this was, this was the first flood that um, um, it started people uh, it started getting people to consider that, oh, we should, we should maybe um, do something about this. Um, interesting factoid, Sutter, um, who John Sutter Sr. Um, never really thought that a, a big settlement or even a city would um, be, in the, be on the side of Sacramento, uh, modern Sacramento. Um, he always thought that uh, uh, the high ground near, well, what is now um, William, William Land Park um, would be the actual settlement, would be the actual city. His son, um, John Sutter Jr. and uh, uh, their business associate, Sam, uh, Samuel uh, uh, Brannon had different thoughts. Um, but back on topic. Um, so back in 1850, 1851, uh, the Sutter Lake um, uh, overflowed, which is not, uh, which is no longer extant. That was filled in um, to accommodate the, um, um, to accommodate the, uh, the train uh, shops um, that are now near uh, Richards Boulevard um, and uh, uh, north, of, north of the, um, uh, the railroad museum uh, in Old Sack. So Sutter Lake um, in 1850-51 overflowed um, and, and overflowed with such uh, force that it ended up knocking um, buildings off their foundations. Um, in fact, it was uh, uh, the flood was so was so extreme that it overflowed at two a.m. in the morning, um, and by six p.m. that evening, um, accounts say that uh, Sacramento had become a a quote unquote second Venice. Um, and in fact, the uh, the Daily Union, the Sacramento Daily Union, a now defunct um, newspaper. Um, describes, uh, even describes people um, taking pleasure craft and, and kind of going through the, through the streets of Sacramento. I find that a little doubtful uh, based upon the other accounts. Um, but 10 years later, um, there was another flood, e uh, even more devastating uh, than the last. Um, again, in December of 61, um, when this photo was uh, was taken here. This is the business district. This is modern day old sack um, flooded. Um, what what happened? Uh, a, a different slough um, overflowed called Burn Slough, and that ran from um, what's now more or less the H Street Bridge um, north of Sac State and flowed. Mm, more or less westish um, toward uh, uh, McKinley Park. Um, in fact, Lake Kiesel, the um, the little water feature, the kind of pond feature, um, used to be part of Burns Slough, and then it flowed uh, again more or less west to the um, uh, to well what are now the water features at at Sutter's Fort, and then it just kind of trailed um, trailed to the south. This slough overflowed, um, overflowed its banks, and um, um, ended up flooding, flooding the city. And um, but then uh, a month later, in January, um, the worst flood visited upon Sacramento um, um, hit, where uh, the levee at um, um, modern day uh, modern day B Street and Thirty um, First. Um, broke um, and ended up flooding the city. Back then, R Street, to go further south, was a uh, was a large another large levee. And interestingly, um, the R Street levee, uh, which was built to protect Sacramento from from flooding from the south, ended up pooling the water in Sacramento to such a point that the only um, high ground um, in in the city was the R Street levee, Poverty Ridge. And um, the levee along Front uh, Front Street in Old Sac. Um, again, we have um, more accounts of buildings set afloat um, to this. Uh, people talking about how buildings would just kind of like move um, uh, move down the street. And 
um, a day or two after, um, the water was still so strong coming through the levee that um, the water picked up a, uh, a steamer called the Gem. Um, I'm still fascinated by the story. I want to do more research on this. Um, but the Gem uh, was a steamer. It was carried through, um, through the break in the levee, not straight. It, wasn't, it didn't go bow first. It went broadside through uh, through the break in the levee and ended up um, ended up beaching itself at modern day 23rd and B Street um, in some guy some poor guy's peach orchard um, and it was there for a month it took them a month to schlep the thing back to um, uh, back to the um, back to the river this is all to say that these floods in, 18, in the 1850s and 1860s were ultimately responsible for redirecting the river, uh, for, for getting the political and financial will to redirect the river. Here we have um, this image, um, which shows the original course of the river um, in uh, uh, modern day downtown. So whereas the modern river cuts straight um, into the Sacramento River. You can see the Sacramento River kind of to that, that bottom right-hand corner. That's the Sacramento River. Um, but the last mile of the American River kind of went along in this kind of et, this treacherous S-shaped curve, putting a lot of strain on, um, on the levees uh, to the south. You can also see down, um, again, in the bottom right side, you can see a little bit of Sutter, uh, Sutter Lake, which is um, responsible for, uh, for so many floods in Sacramento. Ultimately in 1860, um, or I'm sorry, in the 1860s, um, the uh, city engineer, um, A.R. Jackson, um, recommended two sites on the American River to, to be straightened. One of them was um, this S-shaped curve uh, that had to be rechanneled a couple of times um, due to uh, the, the force of the water um, eroding um, both the west side of the Sacramento River and uh, the east side of uh, the Sacramento River. So eroding what we now call West Sac um, and uh, downtown Sacramento. Um, so ultimately this, this area would be straightened out um, to its current course. The other problem, the other place that it was straightened out um, um, was uh, near, um, near a tannery um, on 20, or I'm sorry, on 31st Street, uh, which is where the, the levee broke in um, the 61 flood or the 62 flood. Um, ultimately, they, uh, they found the uh, uh, city of Sacramento through fits and starts um, cut new channels or widened um, pre-existing um, small channels um, to ultimately redirect the flow of the water um, and clear out a lot of like uh, debris and silt that had accumulated and, and made for um, made for a very meandering course. Um, as a result of these floods, um, prior to that, there were a lot of accounts of um, people um, uh, uh, of people being very hesitant, very resistant to um, to the financial uh, necessity of of straightening the river. Um, it wouldn't be until the 1950s that that uh, uh, the the fear of um, of flooding um, would be put largely to rest with the construction of um, the Folsom and Nimbus dams. Um, so fast forwarding a good, you know, 80 years now. Um, but um, yeah, with the, with the construction of the Folsom and Nimbus dams that were constructed more or less in, um, um, more or less in concert, um, the idea being that um, with the construction of Folsom Dam, this would create a, a large reservoir um, that could be let out at a controlled, um, um, at a controlled rate to ultimately accumulate in, um, in Lake Natoma, um, which was created by the construction of the Nimbus Dam a year later. Um, and um, 
it was so important um, and a testament to the sheer power of uh, the freshet of the snowmelt that um, I think it, it, it was the California Parks and um, Department of Parks and Recreation that, that says that with the construction of these dams, um, it ultimately prevented a, another devastating flood in 1964. Um, and just to kind of throw a few, a few numbers, um, a few numbers around, um, the had had these um, two dams not been constructed, the um, Department of Parks and Rec um, credit uh, or say that the um, the levees would have faced uh, floodwaters that reached um, uh, like 15,000 square feet per second above the, the, the levees capacities. Um, so we have actual accounts or we have actual instances of um, how the straightening of the river and the construction of these two dams um, saved Sacramento several times over. Chris, kind of a, uh, going back a few, few minutes um, in your answer, uh, is it true that the, the, the dirt that they pulled out of the ground to help rechannel the river went to raise the city? Yeah, yeah, that was, um, that was another uh, uh, really cool thing to, to find out. The, um, so when they cut, so when they cut uh, the new mouth of the river, um, especially that uh, um, a lot of that, a lot of that debris or a lot of that, um, uh, a lot of that soil and a lot of that rock was ultimately used to um, um, bury um, a good portion of uh, the first story of the, of the, um, right the business district, right? Um, when they straightened the river near uh, B Street um, through, uh, the, the property was called Hoyt Slough. Um, they had to dig out a lot of uh, debris and a lot of, uh, um, and a lot of rock uh, to do the same. And they ultimately used it to do that, to, to raise the city better too. Got it. Yeah, that is another interesting aspect to this whole and, thing. And still something you can see today. Right. Absolutely. If you're standing, if you're standing at the the seawall, right, in old Sacramento, versus standing all the way back, maybe on 12th Street, the elevation drops um, from the seawall down to 12th, as opposed <laughs> to the other way around, like it like it did back in the day, right? So um, it's pretty amazing how things have changed. And in one picture that I apologize. I don't know if I got to show that I'm going to show as soon as I get my act together here. Um, is this pick right here? Um, which, where is that? Oh, so um, 1950, uh, that's the 1950 flood. Um, okay. so, so prior to the, prior to them finishing um, Folsom Lake, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, this is a very interesting, uh, let me change that language, uh, a, a devastating flood. Uh, Where is that? Uh, so with this, this is um, University, the intersection of University Avenue, Folsom Avenue, or uh, Fulton Avenue, and Fair Oaks Boulevard. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, so as you're going down, so in the bottom right-hand corner, there's the, um, that's Fulton uh, okay. Avenue. And you know how, if you're driving south on Fulton <gasps> Avenue, it makes that, that it splits range. off. Yeah, that's okay. Monroe, Monroe Street there. Yeah, Got it. that's what that is um, that, that you can see there. This, and then, and then, and then Fair Oaks would be, yeah, yeah, right, up there. yeah right where your mouse is. Yeah, okay. Luke Loman's Plaza, kind of like in that left, Kind of side okay. on the side, you can't really see too much, but yeah, what is now today's Lumens Plaza? Okay. Yeah, and so the river, yeah, is up there, and it broke. Um, the levee broke right near uh, uh, H Street there, and uh, there is a in the book we have an image of a gentleman that kind of like standing like right at the levee break, looking at, you know at the water coming in. But yeah, it just the flood, just water just came all over that the Arden area there so okay and it went all the way to Del Paso Boulevard oh exactly right it covered 
that you know basically the whole north of north of the uh, north of the river it's um it was a devastating flood right right and even with um the rise of you know what i consider amazing these flood control districts um mm -hmm. all, all around you know the the american river watershed um it it's just still such a hard thing to uh to do, I mean, obviously things have gotten better, but it, but it's always going to be a challenge, I think. Um, all right, so uh, let's see here. My next question. I know that time is a factor here, but the one question I want to end on is, you know, we we go pre-European contact all the way to to the present day, and I was wondering if um, you all could talk a bit about what's not changed from the very beginning of our timeline to today? Um, you know, so many things have changed, but what, what's a recurring theme um, with the American River? Well, um, you know, in terms of like what has changed, well, let me, let me preface that by saying, you know, this, this area, this land, you know, it, it, did belong to the mission and, 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 you know, they were, they were forced out, they were killed, um, you know, violence and, and uh, violence perpetrated on these people. Um, in terms of what has changed this, this is not the same river that, that they lived with, that they knew. Um, you know, it's been changed and, and used to fit um, the needs of um, the people who came after who came after the Nishinen, who came after the native peoples here. Um, yeah, that, that is what has definitely changed. It's, it's also worth saying that, um, especially, uh, you know, over this last year, um, there's been a, a greater, greater um, uh, uh, focus on hearing other viewpoints. Um, right here right. and bringing out uh, other voices. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Jason, I, I ask you the same question, yeah. sir. Yes. Um, you know what? What's what stayed the same? Um, same wine, different bottles. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we have a few uh, remaining images. Uh, one is the uh, is uh, the 1930s uh, Hooverville image and. Um, that one, uh, so we brought one of the kind of like what has not changed is that people still go to the river, people on the margins of society um, have always in, this, in the history of Sacramento have, have sought kind of refuge there along the river. Um, you know, it is not a new issue that we're facing today. It's something that has, has happened for a while. And yeah, this is in the 1930s during the Great Depression um, the, the Hoover uh, these these uh, Hoovervilles were 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 developed where people um, uh, lived, and we'll we'll uh, in our upcoming book, you know, we'll kind of talk a little bit more in depth about about these. Um, but uh, but yeah, the um, if you look through different points in Sacramento history, the idea of you know who is living on the river and whether they should or should not be there. I mean, it's something that has always existed and. Um, I think the, the more we realize that, the better we can address any current situation of people uh, living along the river. Um, but then to just kind of end our presentation on kind of more happier notes here. Um, and what- Violence, <laughs> yeah. acts of violence. <laughs> well, pretend violence. So. Yes, um, yes. No, we hope. <laughs> yes, we hope, yeah. No, um, no here we have a, a picture of, uh, they're just identified as Fred and Fern. Um, Oh, you know, the, uh, people go down to the river to, for recreation, have fun. Um, here, you know, your friend and friend are like pretending to throw rocks at each other. Um, but uh, what hasn't changed is the river is still a draw to people. Um, it's still, you know, we, we still want to go there, whether it's just to, to get away from the, the daily grinds of the work or whatever, and we seek, you know, recreation. And then this is our last image we have. And one of the reasons we wanted to include this is, uh, uh, so, well, both Chris and I are, are are cyclists, and so we like riding along the, the parkway and stuff. But uh, so the the young man on the left of the image there, that's Eugene Hepting, 
and he. Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah. Are you kidding me? Nope. Nope. Yeah. Eugene Hefton on the left, and uh, his friend Gene uh, Williams is on the right. Um, okay. But Eugene was on the left there. He was an avid cyclist and held many um, like local endurance records and stuff for cycling. But he was also a photographer, and. Uh, many of the images we actually use in our book uh, come from images that he took. Um, when he'd go on these long cycling trips, he'd have his camera and he was a chronicler of Sacramento history. Um, and so uh, throughout our, our doing the book, we kind of like felt like we developed like uh, since so many of the images we used were of his or at least looking at his images, we kind of felt like this connection, I guess, with, with him. And, uh, right. and uh, so we just kind of wanted to kind of wrap up with yeah, you know, people still, what hasn't changed, you know, people still, you know, like I said, riding their bikes, whether, you know, just kind of relax along the river and uh, just kind of recognize the, um, what a jewel, you know, we have for this, right. this area, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Eugene Hefning, yeah. it's hard to think of, I mean, obviously so many people have contributed to how we understand the history of Sacramento, but um, if, if those out in the audience ever have a chance to go to the Center for Sacramento History, that's where this collection is. Um, you can also go to their website and look at their online catalog. And so much of it is Eugene Hepting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just pumping his bike out to all parts of the county and taking these amazing pictures. So we have a lot to be grateful for when it comes to Eugene Hepting. Well, um, what an amazing river and what an amazing talk. Thank you two for that, um, for your time and for your all the time you put into this book, um, because it's it's a real difference maker for sure. Um, I would go ahead and at this point and direct, um, uh, you know, folks out in the in, in the Zumo sphere to ask any questions they might have of uh, Chris and Jason. And you can take your mute off and, and your, your keep your video on if you'd like to ask a question. And if you don't have any questions, <laughs> that, is, that is okay. Um, one, one thing is filler, I would just say there, there are so many amazing um, stories of, about, you know, the, about the American River. Um, uh, you know, from Folsom, gosh, all the way down. And, and you can start with the Nishinen. As far as I can tell, if you look at the works of Hepting and, and Krober, no, no less than nine villages um, along the American from the confluence all the way up to Folsom. And that's not including rivers, you know, up the Sacramento um, going north and then going south. Um, yeah, there, there was, um, you know, so much, you know, information and stuff that we you knew we learned and took in and, and writing this book. And uh, the the format of the book kind of limits itself to, I mean, you know, it's primarily images um, and uh, kind of there's a structured format of like how many images and like how many words. And yeah. so there's so many things um, we could not put in there. We just didn't have the space. And uh, I know Chris and I would love to at some point kind of go back and also maybe yeah. kind of include in some format or other some more of those stories that you know didn't make the into the book or um, yeah kind of other avenues of exploring that. So, so we do have questions. They're they're yeah, popping awesome. into the, okay. the chat. So um, one uh, one person has a question. Can you review? Which towns were the temperance towns? So, Christopher? Uh, Fair Oaks and Orangevale. Okay. So, Fair Oaks uh, and Orangevale. W one thing that, that I'll just throw in there, I know that when, when Mather Field was put in, um, the, the U.S. Army Sanitation Department wanted to make sure that there was a halo around Mather Field, basically five miles out in either direction, where no liquor could be served at all. So they dried out that area. I'm not sure if the Oasis, which would have been the saloon on the Fair Oaks Bridge, was, was part of that. 
Um, I know that there were five specific ones in Mill Station and Eagle's Nest and a few others um, that, that were told no more boobs, at least until the war ended um, and until, of course, after Prohibition. Um, but uh, yeah, temperance, we're right on the cusp of it and, and the Bolstead Act. Um, so, oh, so question, the next project um, is your extinct villages, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. More talk on Hoboken and on this mysterious uh, Boston. Um, Very mysterious. Yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes towns go away, right, in the context of, you know, how civilizations act and how settlements act. But, you know, there are other reasons. Um, and so I know that that you two and Eric are going to dig deeper into that. So we, we're looking forward to that book. The working title is The Lost Towns and Villages of Sacramento County. We're looking forward to that book coming out about this time next year. So you've got a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and we're still, we're, still, we're still trying to figure out exactly, you know, which towns and villages, yeah. you know, kind of include. And, and, and we're still learning also, you know, about different ones and like, have you heard of this before? It's like, I yeah. don't know this one. It's like, you know, it's like. Right, so, right. Yeah. And, and for the ones that, so you're going to cover like seven or eight, like bigger towns, yeah. but then you're going to have a glossary that will cover as many as possible where you've got maybe a paragraph. So it's going to be really thorough. And I think it's just so exciting. Um, great project. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so next project, and then is the book available at the library, asks CM, and answer that question is definitely, it is available. Um, so you can go to uh, saclibrary.org, type in uh, Lower American River. There's also a book called History of the Lower American River, a terrific book. Um, done but but this is a bit of an update on that um that other one's had several editions done uh and so you can hold the book online and you can pick it up at the library of your choice when it's ready to go um oh so the question where were the the native american villages Located, so that's a great question. Um, of course, uh, we can speak to Kadima, um, which was a Nishinan village that would indeed have been located at the point where Watt Avenue crosses the American River. But there's Sama, Somo, um, Sakum. Um, these are all villages from the mouth of the Columbia very Columbia. I'm going to Portland tonight, everyone. So you can tell that I'm thinking ahead. Um, River, James. Right. Sacramento River. Um, but from that point in, and of course, where two rivers meet for Native America, serious mystical uh, uh, importance um, for, for those culture groups. Um, so, I'm, so, Betsy, you're asking that question. If you do have a chance to send me an email at this address and remind me, I will go ahead and give you the names of the villages um, beyond the ones I just gave you because it's either Ralph Beals or Al Krober in their um, in their works their works at UC Berkeley cover that, um, so I can I can send you that information. Okay, um, and then, oh, so many questions. Um, how about history of the river? Oh, preservation efforts with with the river. Any any information on that? Yeah, that that was an area that we kind of wish we were able to cover a little bit more um, in our book. The um, we'll be upfront. So when we were writing this. Um, was right when like we had just started getting our images and everything and then the pandemic hit and everything shut down 
Um, so that kind of created a little bit of a hindrance um, as we were um, trying to figure out the directions of the, of the book. And so we, then we had to make some uh, decisions based on what was available. Um, and so one of the things that we would have loved to cover more is, the, yeah, the kind of basically the creation of the parkway and uh, the, the efforts of the organizations like uh, Save the American River Association, uh, Sacramento Stop. Audubon, yeah. Um, like I said, you know, starting back in the 50s, you know, you start seeing a, a, this change of people realizing, you know, we need to kind of maybe preserve what we have here. And, um, and, they, and it took uh, a good 20, 25 years of, of the city and county kind of gradually acquiring all these different properties um, and to kind of have this uh, extended parkway that goes from the, the confluence all the way up to Folsom Lake. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, we would love to be able to kind of go a little bit more depth about like some of those efforts of those different groups and because um, it was not an easy process. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're glad that there were people who kind of recognized we need to keep this river and, you know, as, and, and do something about it. So. By the way, the um, Save the American River, uh, a group called the Sacramento Amateur Movie Makers Club um, in the 11th hour, um, when I know the County Board of Supervisors were voting on the development of the parkway, um, they showed this movie that they put together on the merits, the beauty, the natural beauty and everything that would be gained by keeping the river wild, keeping, um, you know, sort of a, a greenway intact. That was shown to the Board of Supervisors and apparently it had a huge impact on, um, you know, the preservation efforts of the river. Um, but we have that in our collection, by the way, everyone, if you'd like to come take a look at it, done by uh, Jewel Dawson and, and her group at the uh, Amateur Movie Makers Club. Another question, uh, so many good questions, um, and it's related more to the next book, but do you two know anything about the town of Walltown? I think I saw it on a map, um, couldn't find any info online. It's northeast of Slough House. Any, any thoughts on Walltown? So I don't have any information about that, but I'm definitely, I've wrote that down um, and so to kind of learn, learn more, and like I said, there's different things, you know, as like I said, as we um, are doing our research now, where it's like, you know, um, learning about these different towns that appeared, um, just for instance, like the town of Dredge, and it became wow. Natoma, um, you know, it was like a basically a, 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 a business, a, a company town that was formed, and so, you know, it's just like all these different bits of history that you know, popped up, and so, yeah, no, we'll definitely kind of look more into into that so okay so yeah there it's so cool it, it's uh it's a it's the effort of of these three information professionals to do a little archaeology right to bring some of these these early settlements back to life a little bit and there were so many um what we know is what's here you know from fair oaks yeah. to the west sac to, to north sacramento but there's so much more there um, and then uh, one last question here from Jake, where can I purchase the book? What's the best place to purchase the book? Your local bookseller. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so a lot, of, right, a lot of independent bookstores, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Avid Reader, uh, yeah. uh, Beers um, over on S, right. um, or, yeah. or any of your your local your local bookseller, please support them. <laughs> and you can you can also visit like some local museums. Um, I know, for instance, like the uh, Sacramento History Museum has our right. book on the shelf. Um, and other local uh, groups like that have that available as well. And in Myra got hers at uh, at Beers. Beers, yeah. So that's great. And you can also go directly to um, Arcadia publishing, mm -hmm. acadiapublishing.com and just buy it like right at the point of contact. Um, and all proceeds from the book go to um, the Sacramento Public Library um, and then into the general fund. So um, 
your purchase is greatly appreciated. Um, so thank you. And I will say thank you to our scholars. So Christopher and Jason, thank you so much for your time. Um, what a great book, very thoughtful. And again, I'm gonna say really well written. And if, if you all know the Arcadia Press books, that they're very structure oriented. So they only give you a certain amount of space to, to tell a story. And these two uh, wasted no space. They used all of it to tell it um, like it should be told. So um, really great book. So thank you to both of you for your You're work. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Yeah, right. it's been a, yeah. No, and I look pleasure. forward to having you guys back um, along with Eric for the, um, for the next book that you're writing. I also want to thank everybody who came in to visit us today and um, be here for the talk on this really, really hot day. Um, stay hydrated, stay cool. And um, we'll see you in September with another talk. In the meantime, look for that interview I'm going to post. Thanks, everybody. And um, we'll see you soon.